So, um, today we'll start talking about market failures and how we can correct them. Um, we'll start by discussing the idea of an externality and particularly the, uh, formalizing it in terms of the notion of a missing price and how the uh, Goo's principle suggests that we should target the solutions to the problems of externalities as close as possible to those problems. Um, and uh, we should try to make people bear the consequences that their actions have for other people. But if those are uncertain, that can create uh, risk and that, that's a problem. We'll then try to get a better understanding of what is and is not an externality by talking about some surprising examples of things that are externalities and surprising examples of surprising examples of things that are actually not externalities. So we'll talk about pecuniary externalities, what are called internalities, which are externalities within a person, and the non-identity problem. Uh, then we'll talk about public policy solutions to externality problems, Bagubian taxes, cap and trade, and the legal system. And then we'll talk about trade-offs between the different approaches. Um, Um, and then we'll talk about uh, Stigler's Coase theorem and potential bargaining solutions to externalities problems, the notion that people can bargain to efficiency if property rights are well defined. And we'll talk about when private solutions like this make sense, but overall argue that uh, they don't really offer a solution. Um, and that what's really crucial is who has the right information. And that if the public authority has the right information, a public solution will be superior. If private parties have the right information, uh, that will be superior. And that will lead into the class on Thursday. So the most classic example of an externality is to imagine a world with n people, um, which has some utility, which depends on the number of miles they drive, uh, the temperature it is outside, uh, and their income. So, uh, because of global warming, uh, the global world temperature depends on the average number of miles people drive. People drive more, uh, the world gets hotter. So, if, um, if the miles driven have some price based on, say, the price of oil, M per mile driven, then everyone is going to choose the point where the utility to them of driving an additional mile, UM, is equal to the price. Right? Um, but um, everyone could be better off if rather than doing this, uh, instead people did what? Mike Gonzalez. Is Mike Gonzalez here? Yeah. Yeah. So everyone's going to use this formula, price is equal to their marginal utility. What should they be doing instead? Price equal to marginal cost. So there's an, can, you, can you see what the externality here is and how you would internalize that? Or, or what, what are they not taking into account that they should be taking into account to make everyone else better off? As you drive, you increase the global warming? Yeah, that's right. So, or you, you like, contribute to it? Yeah. So, what so was you that? Have to take into account the, the increase in temperature that you would be causing by driving. Yeah, that's right. So, this um, shouldn't be here actually. So, forget about this N. Uh, you should set the price, rather than just equal to the marginal private benefit, it should be the price plus the externality you cause, which means it depends on average miles, is F prime times U, how much the temperature increases when the average driver increases, plus how much people value that, times how much people value that, equal to the <coughs> marginal cost. So, uh, the problem is that in the absence of some sort of government intervention, People don't take into account the fact that they cause the planet to be warmer 
and therefore potentially people to be better or worse off uh, because of uh, their behavior. So if people like it to be warmer, then this is a positive externality and people should be driving more than they are. If people don't want it to be warmer, then it's a negative externality and they should be driving less uh, in order to cool things down. So the decentralized outcome is no longer optimal um, because there's no market price for global temperatures. No one has to pay when the planet gets warmer, even though it makes people better or worse off. And this means that people will fail to take into account the effect that they have on global temperatures, even though this matters from a social perspective. Okay. So, um, Pigou's principle <coughs> more generally says that if people are heterogeneous and they, they want to maximize total wealth, we can always redistribute income among people. And therefore, the key thing is that we should take into account the um, average externality that we cause to other people. And that we should have to pay a price or get a subsidy for any action we take for the average externality it causes. So that average externality is the number of people affected by the externality, the average effect it has on their utility, times uh, the effect that our action has on whatever the, the value they get. Um, and this is called the Goose Principle of Payment in Accordance with Product. People should pay the average externality caused by their action. And this is not just <coughs> economics, but this is sort of common sense. You sort of think that any time you hurt someone else, you should have to be forced to compensate them for that. Right? This is sort of like the most basic ideas of justice that people have. And in effect, this is what markets make you do for many things in life, right? So when you want to have an extra pizza, you have to pay for the cost to society of providing you that pizza. When you want to have um, a new car, you have to pay for the cost of the company for manufacturing that car. But when you uh, drive a car and you warm up the planet, you don't have to pay for the consequences that it has for other people, the cost that it imposes on that and externality policy tries to get you to pay for those things. So, um, this is basically the only way to consistently <laughs> ensure that people have the right incentives to <coughs> take the right actions. And um, the second element of the Goose Principle is that interventions aimed at dealing with this problem should focus on the product whose price is missing. So that is, if there's global warming, there's lots of things we could do to reduce it. We could like, you know, create green energy, we could reduce driving, you know, we could, I mean, there's many, many different ways. And many governments have, you know, uh, started doing things like subsidizing green energy, subsidizing uh, solar cells, etc. <coughs> but most economists would say that that's not really the right approach. That if the problem is with too much energy being used, then the tax should fall directly on energy, directly on carbon, that causes the problem, rather than indirectly on other things that are related to it. So, a sort of exact opposite to this um, is actually the policy that many economists advocate to deal with recessions. So what's the problem in a recession? Not enough people are hiring, and not enough people are spending. And so what do economists advocate doing? A lot of the time they say, well, you know, build a road or, you know, uh, send people a check and hope they spend it. So what does that have to do with getting people to spend more or buy more? I mean, it's like, it's an extremely indirect way of addressing that problem, right? <coughs> if you send someone a check and hope they spend it, why not just instead pay them if they spend money? So something that would make a lot more sense is to reduce the sales taxes. So that it, like, you put the whole country on sale for a year and get them to spend a lot of money this year rather than spending the money next year, <coughs> right? Um, so a cyclically varying sales tax is much more of a Peguvian remedy because it targets exactly the problem that we think exists rather than indirectly doing something that we hope might eventually lead to the problem. Another example of that is a lot of people were concerned about the banks not lending. 
uh, during the credit crisis, and they said, okay, so what we've got to do is bail out the banks. So why not instead give them money if they lend money, right? So you could subsidize their lending rather than you know, bailing them out, and that would more directly stimulate them to do the things you want to do. So the general principle is, you know, rather than targeting something which may or may not have some indirect relationship to the thing you want to achieve, you should target as specifically as you can the, the problem that you think exists. Okay. So Pigou's principle is quite powerful because it always gives the right incentives. But it can be quite problematic when there's risks involved. So suppose that you're, um, you paid for all the harm <coughs> caused by your car, right? Um, imagine you had a terrible accident and you ended up killing someone. Then you'd have to pay basically with your own life. You'd have to like be killed. Or you'd um, very least have to make some enormous payments. The value of that person's life was you know, millions and millions of dollars. And the problem with this sort of eye for an eye justice, especially when the act that you did was unintentional, uh, it seems kind of crazy, right? It doesn't seem reasonable that we should be doing these very extreme punishments even though you didn't mean to cause the harm just because you ended up causing that harm. Um, even though this gives you the right incentives in some sense, it exposes you to a horrible risk that sort of by no fault of your own, you're going to end up being you know, executed or thrown in jail or uh, fined millions of dollars. So this is the reason why in many of these are areas, we have things like car insurance, which make sure that you know, if you're forced, if you are in an accident, there's someone else to pay for those harms that you caused. And we have traffic regulations, which stop you from doing things that will increase the chance that you do something really bad. Now, those don't directly target the effect that we want. They don't directly target the reduction in harm to other people. But because it would just be too difficult or create too much risk to directly cause you to pay the consequences of your action, we have to instead stop you from doing actions which might cause those consequences. Um, and we'll return to some of these issues about risk in lecture 11, uh, which I guess is in two weeks. Okay. <coughs> so the second problem with this <coughs> that even if we didn't care about uh, all the risk created by these very extreme punishments, the truth is most people may not just have enough money to pay the relevant fine. So most people driving a car couldn't pay enough to compensate for the death of somebody else. They're just not ever going to make enough money in their whole life to do that. And this is certainly the case, yeah, when you kill someone in a car. Um, and this makes payments in accordance with product Impossible. It makes it impossible for you to afford to pay for the consequences of your actions. And this makes necessary other methods for stopping uh, behavior. Um, and uh, all these raise very similar incentive issues to what you looked at in problem two of problem set one. So you, you have to figure out how to deal with these issues of risk and the person not being able to pay, and still give them good enough incentives to perform. Now, um, so those are some issues in dealing with um, externalities. But the question first is, what even is an externality? So uh, let's consider an example. Imagine I discover a giant hoard of gold, um, and that causes gold prices to fall. And, there's, uh, and it makes other people who own gold, other than myself, worse off, right? Because now their gold is worth less. Uh, Abigail, is that an <coughs> externality? Um, not, not really. Why not? Um, because although people that already have gold are worse off, you're better off. Mm, no, I mean, that's true in terms of, sm you know, smoking or driving your car as well, right? You're better off if you drive your car, but that makes other people worse off, so that's well, not... The, the person that buys the gold from you benefits. Yeah, so the people in general who buy gold benefit, right? So for every dollar 